by thanking you all for taking time out of your day. I know there's a lot of uh, calls that uh, people get on. For some reason, it seems like the number of meetings has increased since COVID. So I'm thankful for you uh, dedicating a little bit of your time to coming. Uh, it's an honor to be here. And I wanted to thank Walter in particular. Uh, the Humanities Center is a really important institution on campus. And uh, Walter, since I've been here, has been in charge of it. And it's a really good way, you know, uh, management uses the term silos all the time. And unfortunately, uh, sometimes we're siloed by where we're placed in the university. And uh, I found that this is a good way to get feedback and to interact with others. And I really thank Walter for the opportunity to be with you today. I'm going to try something a little different today. Uh, because General Baker uh, is a hero to mine and uh, was known by many of you, uh, I, I really want to try and uh, center his voice today. As somebody writing a biography of General, uh, it's very important to me to kind of stay true to his voice. So what I've done here today is I, I've compiled a couple different uh, oral histories that uh, either I've done or other people have done and kind of interspersed them throughout a broader presentation uh, that I'll be showing you in a little bit. Uh, and I really wanted to focus on, as Walter um, alluded to, you know, Baker is most known for his involvement in drum and the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. And I think Frederick Jameson uh, called these the most uh, important uh, political developments in the 1960s. Mirable, I think, called them, uh, you know, the most uh, important political developments uh, in the United States, uh, Black movement period, uh, Robin Kelly has said similar things, but I, I'm interested today in kind of highlighting kind of how he came to be the person that was there to organize the plants in 1968 and found drum. Uh, so I'm really concerned with his, you know, the process in which he became uh, politicized as well as kind of radicalized and became a revolutionary. Because I think the important thing when we talk about generals to never forget that he committed his life uh, really till his death towards overturning kind of a system that he saw as inherently inequitable and unjust. And he was a revolutionary. And I, and I think that's important because he was nice and sometimes revolutionaries aren't depicted as nice people uh, for whatever reason. And you could be both in general was both. So I hope to make that clear when I share my screen here and show you the first image that I have. Okay, so here's the opening. This is a general with his daughter, Carolyn. Uh, sorry for the glass, but I took the picture. It was in a frame at the Baker household. Uh, and anyone that knew him uh, understood that smile. He's probably known for a hearty smile, uh, as well as his will, you know, political will and the fight in him. But his humor, uh, his hearty smile, uh, laugh as well. Uh, and for, you know, being one of the few people that I found that was able to, you know, really uh, be so active publicly and also be very active within the home, right, within his family, uh, raised generations of kids uh, and was always there. I would go by to see General towards the end of his life and ask him if he's going to be somewhere. He'd be like, I'd be there, but I have to take care of the basketball. You know, so he was dedicated in, in his public and private life. Uh, he, he, he comported himself as how he saw, like Che Guevara used to talk about a revolutionary individual, and he carried that over into all aspects of his life. So instead of me intro introducing him, I wanted to let General introduce himself. And this is audio uh, taken from the uh, uh, U.S. social forum. here in Detroit in September the 6th, 1941, at the old St. Albert Hospital. Uh, Dr. Ocean Sweet delivered me, slapped me on my butt when I came out of my mama's womb. So he not only gave me my birthright, but passed on a legacy of struggle, and I tried to live to carry that out the rest of the days of my life. So I, I just want to share that with you. He was very proud of the fact that Dr. Sweet, of course, uh, delivered him, and all of you know who Dr. Sweet is, uh, most likely, 
but a quick synopsis, you know, in, in the 1925, I believe, Dr. Sweet moved into a house on uh, Garland and Charlevoix, and a mob formed around his house, uh, and they decided to fight back. And that really was a defining characteristic of, of General and, and kind of his early ideology, uh, as well as the one he carried uh, until he passed. Uh, so writing a biography of General is a daunting task in many ways, because as Jerry knows, uh, General was quite a historian as well. He was deeply interested in the study of history, uh, and as, as is manifested in your interview with him. Uh, and like I used to see him in the archive, and I'll never forget one of the happiest days I ever saw him. He had found uh, what he thought was a copy of Ford Facts, which was the newspaper put out primarily by a uh, the communist party is that people were organizing the UAW at Ford. And it turns out this was a, a false version that he had, but it was put out by the, uh, the company itself to try and besmirch the emerging union movement. But uh, he was uh, very much uh, a historian and a top rate one at that. And I will say this as someone that uses oral history to a, a large degree, General had a magnificent memory uh, so as somebody that goes back and checks dates and things of that nature, uh, his, his recall was outstanding because he was always thinking about the past and how to learn from it. So uh, this quote just reads, you can't proceed to take one or two steps forward without knowing where you've been. History is the rock we stand on. And when you ain't on it, you ain't on a rock, you're on sand that will get you swept right out from under you. So study was like a, a critical component of kind of how he thought uh, politically, but also just how he thought about learning in general, and how important it was. And kind of to that point, uh, one of the works that kind of general really was impacted by was Du Bois's Black Reconstruction in America. And this was a book that uh, during the Cold War was, had been out of print. And it was uh, re-released, I believe, in 1963. And they would study this along with Marx and Lenin and Stalin. Uh, and, and it had a tremendous impact on him. In fact, as I'll show you later, he references this book and some of the arguments contained in it when the first call to form a League of Revolutionary Black Workers was made. Uh, and so I wanted to kind of include this uh, because the book was so meaningful to him, just a short segment about something that's very different from people today. Like there was a hunger for information about not only black history, but revolutionary history, right? So one of the things that General did before he started working at the auto plants was he worked at a black bookstore. One of the first that I know of in the city and it was the African Nationalist Pioneers bookstore on Woodward, Woodrow Wilson. Uh, which he worked at simultaneously when he worked at Woolworth, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Access to a few books there, too, because by 1963, a few things are coming out of publication. I think uh, Black Reconstruction had been reprinted uh, by Du Bois, stuff like that you could get your hands on, that they were a real gem. I, I, I just really want to express how important books was. Whenever you could find a book, like any Black author, you had to grab it and snatch it and hold it fast. <laughs> So I, I just wanted to play that because that was such a big part of the group he was with, uh, trying to educate themselves about what was going on in the world, about how to advance the struggle in the U.S. and how to advance revolutionary struggle at a global level. Now, the audio on some of these are pretty bad, and I apologize if they crack your ears. But another thing that General used to do, and I, it's really something that Marcia does terribly well and... Uh, with the GBI, we've been putting on a, a series kind of reevaluating Detroit, I Do Mind Dying. You can catch us uh, if you go to the GBI's page uh, Sundays at three o'clock. We have different uh, series. And the first one they did, Marshall was involved in, and it's really trying to set the stage for the development, the political development in which General, others, and Marsha uh, kind of came of age in. Uh, Marsha later, but General and others earlier on. Um, and for him, culture was terribly important uh, as a way of kind of understanding kind of like the people, but also struggle. So I just want to play this and I'll reiterate this point in a minute. And I think enough work is not done on a relationship between the social movement 
you know, and and and, and the popular uh, expression in culture. You know, more work got to be done because because that's what give our movement like, right? To move from one section to the other. I got a I got a song by uh, Nina Simone the other day. I had never heard of it. And it was a song that's at a concert she did right after King died. And the song is, What We Gonna Do Now Since King is Dead. And it's a beautiful piece. I never heard it before. Uh, but it, it, it's not out there like that that we have to capture to to express a moment in history that, that, that really would make it lasting. Uh, you know, culture makes it lasting, right? Because in, 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 the, in the, what do you call it, the peaks and valleys of the movement, we need culture to get us through. You know, Quentin uh, uh, Bowser tell you to say, an army without culture is a dog with an army, and a dog with an army can't win. <laughs> I love that quote. That's part of why I played it, too. But I think enough oh, work is not done. Let me let me move on here real quick. But I, I will say this is that's important to me because the way that General conceptualized this history, despite being a materialist, right, he would always view these things in kind of like how it was manifested in the culture. And I'll give you an example of that uh, at the end of this uh, slide. So Jen is born September 6th in 1941. Uh, shortly after uh, uh, he had he was born shortly after his parents had moved up from Georgia to seek wartime employment. His father was beyond the draft age, but like many black men during the period was drafted nonetheless, right? So uh, he, this is kind of like that generation which he grew up in a baby boom generation, if you will, uh, and came right to the city, you know, while thousands of others uh, were coming uh, from the South, black and white. Um, like many other black Northerners of the period, he personally experienced Jim, the Jim Crow of the South through his visits in the summer to his family and relatives in Georgia. And, you know, I think this is important as well. You know, people have identified, civil rights movement and historians have always identified that a lot of the people that were involved in movement activity in the South, uh, particularly Southerners, were deeply kind of politicized by the, uh, the murder of Emmett Till. And General uh, located this as an early point of kind of coming to not only uh, political awareness, but also to a deep-seated anger against America, right? That, that kind of got him in the direction of pursuing kind of like a, a means to change society as it was constructed. And of course, this was reiterated in kind of his experiences in Detroit, uh, going to school, Southwestern High School, for example, uh, and, and it's a really interesting period to me uh, in the late 50s and, and coming of age during that period because it's one of the few moments, it's one of these kind of like transitional moments in Detroit. I mentioned here like uh, politically, economically, but even spatially to give Peter Hammer a nod here uh, because neighborhoods were in transition. Uh, they're converting from black to white or white to black as black people are kind of expanding and white people are moving to the suburbs. But there are these periods anywhere from five to 10 years in which these communities are oftentimes in flux. And white people are responding obviously in a variety of ways. They form a, you know, a spate of, uh, you know, a community council seeking to keep black people out, but they're also redrawing districts in terms of education. Uh, and so, in areas where that can't be done, oftentimes there's uh, interracial, there's schools that are interracial, but what happens in those schools is people get tracked, much like Malcolm X was tracked uh, when he was coming of age. In general, was tracked into, uh, you know, into the trades rather than uh, college level curriculum. Uh, Luke Tripp the other day was talking about the same thing and the way that he was able to escape this was by leaving the public schools and transitioning to a Catholic school, right? So there's all this discrimination people are facing in school. You know, the quality of education is high at that time in Detroit public schools, but in many ways, teachers are prohibiting people from having access to all the classes that were available to them. And of course, police, as always, kind of were a brutal force, particularly for young uh, black men. Uh, and there's, you know, you go through the newspapers time after time, uh, during the 40s, 50s, and early 60s of police violence against Black people. This is when the period when the Big Four became notorious, 
Uh, Miriani becomes mayor on the premise of basically keeping young white women safe uh, from the approaching menace of the black population. And, you know, it's in the tail end of Kobo too. So there's this uh, Cold War conservatism at the time too that uh, uh, people are encountering, uh, general included in the 1950s. Uh, his father uh, worked at Midland Steel and then later in the plants, but in the 1950s uh, lost his job at Midland Steel. Uh, and there was a tremendous economic downturn. This is how the 50s is uh, traditionally remembered, but Chrysler cut 40% of its workforce during the, what they call the Eisenhower recessions, right? So here's a clip of Jen talking about kind of the economic situation in the late 50s that he experienced along with his family. So if I can get it on here. I'm gonna say that uh, when I finished high school in 1958, was the most difficult years of my life at that time. That's the first time I ever saw commodity cheese was in 1958. Uh, in 1958, after uh, the end of the Korean War, the whole auto industry almost collapsed in this city. By 56 and 57, there were massive layoffs at all the auto plants. I think 1958 was the year that Ford came out with the famous Edsel car. And the Edsel, before recently, I uh, had the most uh, disgraceful introduction of any car before. It was the biggest flop in history. Uh, but anyway, uh, things were so bad that me and my father would go out looking for work together in 58. And the auto industry really didn't pick back up, you know, until 1962 and 63 when they started hiring after the Kennedy election in 1960 and the beginning outbreaks of the Vietnam War. So we had a real difficult time in Detroit during those periods of time. I have sections of my family that live in Akron, Ohio, uh, because when Chrysler laid them off in 57, the first call they got back was in 1962 in Twinsburg, Ohio. So they had to transfer to Twinsburg, Ohio to take jobs after being laid off for almost six years. And I got a whole section of the family that stayed down there after that. So the way that General used to tell this story was by quoting popular culture. He mentioned that uh, there's a song that came out in the late 50s, and this was the song. So I believe that was the silhouettes in the late 50s. And uh, he used to always say that, you know, when the economy started to recover in the early 60s, then Smokey and the Miracles came out with this song. See, this is the problem with doing this stuff and not being a technical wizard. I apologize for that. Um, I, I should add, too, that it, it's, it's telling, too, that Chrysler, uh, when Chrysler laid off 40% of the workforce, it, it hit black workers, obviously, particularly hard because they're replacing in, uh, positions that black people used to occupy. And, of course, Chrysler became the dominant kind of employer of uh, black Detroiters at that time because so many of the other automotive companies were fully automating and moving out to the suburbs and to other states at that time. Uh, so during this time, uh, Jen is, uh, starts to get politically involved uh, while he's a student. Uh, he first goes to Highland Park uh, Public Schools, uh, Highland Park Community College, and at that time, he's kind of like dabbling in a whole bunch of different things uh, from civil rights to black nationalism. And he's kind of like searching for a way. And I'll, I'll have him describe this here. I, I, was, I was a member of the youth branch of the NAACP and a member of Friends of SNCC. SNCC didn't have a, a chapter in Detroit. We had a Friends of SNCC, and I belonged to that. I stayed on the Friends of SNCC of the of Max of the uh, Muslim movement. I never joined the Muslims, but I stayed there with that level of activity. I stayed with the United Negro Improvement Association. The difficulty I had with both of them was that they never did. They never took place in activity. They just wanted to study, talk, try to clean yourself up. But the activity was missing. So I kind of had a, a dual kind of existence. I tried to stay attached to activist organizations that wanted to do something. 
at the same time try to stay with the organization that had an ideological position that I could try to learn and study with. So actually at, at this time, he is pretty much ideologically a black nationalist and he, he's seriously thinking about going, he's trying to ultimately to get a job in the automobile plants where he could learn a trade that he's hoping he could take to Africa, maybe Ghana or some other independent nation and help with their development, right? So at this time, he characterized himself maybe as a civil rights militant or a black nationalist. He was attracted to action, right? And I think that's very important because he and his comrades of his age group, right, were far more militant than a lot of the other people around, including some of the people that other people thought were extremely militant. So they, they had problems with the Henry brothers, for example, or Reverend Plague, who was considered to be a militant at that time. And I'll get to that in one second. Uh, and of course, they were all as kind of like what uh, James Smethurst and others call kind of like proto-black uh, power activists or what would later be known as uh, revolutionary nationalists deeply influenced by Robert F. Williams. And of course, General would later become good friends with both Rob and Mabel. Uh, and he used to have a show, Radio Free Dixie. And this was played all across the country on like bootleg tapes that people would get and listen to. So here, here's General talking about the impact of Robert F. Williams, of course, famous from uh, the stand that he took in Monroe, North Carolina against the Ku Klux Klan and later fled to Cuba and then China after facing uh, false kidnapping charges. But what, the reason I want to tell you the story is because Robert Williams started a radio show from Cuba called Radio Free Dixie. And it's a book called Radio Free Dixie that talks about his show. And we used to get together in my little apartment when I was at in Highland Park and we'd, turn, we'd, we'd tune in and pick up Robert Williams broadcasting from Cuba. And it was fantastic. 1963, and they would come on talking about a uh, white man's nigga no more and truth, trust to the earth shall rise again. It's 1963. Uh, we were just traumatized by, by his expressions uh, and his struggle for uprising and for us to fight back. Uh, so that was the, the education I had early on. Uh, and so I began the movement kind of like that. You so one of the things that I, I oftentimes get uh, asked to review stuff uh, regarding the league, and oftentimes uh, like left scholars, white left scholars will come in and they'll look at kind of the pamphlets and the, all the materials, uh, educational and propaganda materials that the league and drum produced. And they, they tend to locate kind of like their origins and like uh, what uh, left thinkers, even whether it's uh, black thinkers like CLR James or uh, Martin Glaberman, or even the, the bogs is uh, locally. And I think the one that oftentimes gets ignored is the kind of importance of an emerging kind of black radical press that's developing in the early 60s. So you have Liberator Magazine out of New York. Uh, later, you'll have the RAM affiliated uh, journals, Soul Book and Black America that Malcolm X was involved in. And I think for, for uh, General and others here, a critical one and one that they took liberally from was Robert F. Williams Crusader, right? Which was, uh, you know, brought in through Canada and distributed through Detroit. So uh, that, that was definitely, in fact, you could see when uh, General John Watson, John Williams uh, and Charles Simmons start to make their own flyers as we'll get to in a minute, uh, sometimes they would take uh, verbatim images taken from the Crusader. Right. So in many ways, it's part of this broader conversation taking place internationally. Uh, and of course, Malcolm X was a tremendous influence on, uh, on not only general, but kind of like the group of people kind of that formed uh, in Detroit, this group of kind of like uh, re revolutionaries at this time uh, and how they kind of came together. Uh, it was there was a regional network of people. Uh, so-called, you know, we refer to them as militants at this time, kind of not like a, a fully formed ideology or political program from places like Cleveland. You have like Don Freeman in Cleveland, for example. You have people in Chicago, uh, Higginbotham and John Bracey. Uh, and I mention this because when Malcolm would speak, they would come to Detroit. And Malcolm came obviously to Detroit, but also Cleveland frequently. But he was close with Reverend Clegg and the Henrys who would uh, record his material. 
And so people would have a chance when they go to see Malcolm speak to me. Uh, so I, I think it's amongst the development of this network that um, General first meets Max Stanford or Mohammed Ahmad uh, at a black, I think it was uh, one of the first black arts conferences uh, that a, a group called Goal had in 1962. Um, and, but they would continue to meet uh, in 1963, and where originally kind of loosely would form a group that later became known as RAM or the Revolutionary Action Movement, right? So this deals with kind of like uh, how much Malcolm meant to them at that time, as well as kind of where they were politically uh, at this moment. In Detroit, definitely. Uh, the, the conference when Malcolm spoke the message to the grassroots, I think it might have been around November of 1963 at the King Solomon Temple. I, like I say, every time Malcolm X came to town, I never missed him. When he came at that time, he had also spoken at a couple other places. He had spoken at Wayne State earlier that day. And we went to the uh, to the, uh, uh, Mal the King Solomon Baptist Church that evening to the rally. Uh, a few of us had uh, was working, helped working as security guards to provide protection for Malcolm along with the Nation of Islam. Uh, so we were there in, in full force. Uh, matter of fact, if you listen closely to the to the tape uh, or the uh, even the film presentation of Message to the Grassroots, you can hear us hollering in the audience. I think it's at one point when Malcolm talks about the uh, the only revolution that's a that's a bloodless revolution is a Negro revolution. And he said, "You afraid to bleed?" You can hear us hollering, "We'll bleed, Malcolm. We'll bleed." That, that's got to be my favorite. <laughs> I, love, I love playing that. But you could actually hear it. Like, I have a record of this, and you could actually, you could actually hear it on the record. Um, so I, and it's a, it, this is kind of a, something that I found in, in my, my research as well. Like, um, he would do, and the group around him, which became Uhuru, right, would do security for Malcolm when he came here. But there's a later period in which he's in a gun club. In general, was very astute and could read a room. And so like, uh, there's a guy who's asking him about Malcolm at a meeting of the gun club about a year later, uh, maybe a year and a half later. And General, you could tell, doesn't trust this guy. And so the FBI reports that he says to them, they're asking him about Malcolm. And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. My leader is Reverend Martin Luther King. And then later when he gets interviewed, the police try to interview him, the FBI. And he's like, I'm not talking to you. He's like, I'm not talking to you after what you did to my leader, Martin Luther King. So <laughs> he was very aware of kind of, uh, you know, them being after them uh, and could, could read them pretty good. All right, so this gets to kind of like uh, the local scene, right? Uh, and kind of what Malcolm was so attracted to, right? We, this is, Detroit was the kind of like epicenter of black nationalist thought in many ways in the 60s, right? Uh, particularly since Malcolm rose to a position of prominence in the Nation of Islam, the, the Nation of Islam had grown. But there are, of course, the birth and rise of the Black Christian nationalist movement that is kind of like taking place as all this is going on and most associated with Reverend Cleed, uh, who put out, uh, formed a group called Group on Advanced Leadership, which was seen as a more militant challenge to kind of like traditional middle class civil rights leadership in the city. Uh, and more nationalist, of course, in orientation. And they had this paper, the Illustrated News. I'm sorry I didn't get a good representation of this, but they would print these in pink, right, to make them stand out. And as they note, a biweekly circulation of 35,000, right? So uh, Goal would sponsor a number of things. They were involved politically. They uh, formed the Freedom uh, Now Party. Uh, Clegg would run for office in 64. Uh, they ran a black slate. Uh, and really was an epicenter of a lot of kind of more militant challenges to groups like even the Trade Union Leadership Council at the time, which had a group just juxtaposed the names. Uh, that group was named One uh, Operation Negro Equality, right? They also had a paper, it was called uh, Negro Vanguard. And that comes back later because General would start a paper in 1964, 1965 called Black Vanguard, right, in opposition to, you know, the Negro Vanguard. But what really kind of got the group Uhuru started, and let me be clear about this, Uhuru was a group kind of loosely formed in the late 1962. Uh, some of the people I had mentioned before, John uh, Watson, John Williams, uh, 
Charles Simmons, General, uh, a woman named Gwen Kemp, uh, Rufus Griffin and others. Um, and it was a group of students, but they didn't have official sanction from the university. And they weren't a student organization per se, uh, focusing on student issues on campus. Instead, they went out into the community to deal with the issues they faced when they stepped off campus. And more importantly, they started to really challenge kind of like mainstream leadership and take on issues that they were afraid to touch, right? And organize in the places that they weren't organizing. So the housing projects, for example, uh, they would go down to and organize and agitate. Uh, and the big thing that kind of made them known, not only to the public, but also to the police, was their campaign around the, the murder, the police murder of Cynthia Scott, who was a sex worker in 1963. Uh, she was shot twice. Uh, Jen will say five times, but I've seen the autopsy report at this time. It was shot twice uh, in the back and side uh, by an, a Detroit police officer who many in the community thought was extorting her. Uh, charging her money to avoid arrest after arresting her a number of times previously. And the community came out with it and had an idea that all this was not only as quickly covered up by the police department, but then, you know, an investigation was conducted in two days by the prosecutor's office. And the community read on this, that this was a cover up of the fullest extreme. Uh, not only of the police, but the prosecutor's office, et cetera. And I, I'll say this, if somebody who successfully got the document years later uh, by filing a random FOIA request for this uh, homicide file, the community had it exactly right, right? Exactly what they said happened, right? I mean, beyond the you know, provocation, whether or not he was extorting or not is, remains unclear. But this was kind of a crystallizing moment and a challenge to kind of the established leadership who didn't want to touch the, the case and presented Ms. Scott as somebody who didn't deserve protection because of her line of work, right? So they came in and challenged that notion and forced people to take account. And ultimately, uh, there's a massive protest at 1300 Bobian uh, that was the police station uh, and they were gonna carry the casket. And by the time they had this protest, it's over a thousand people, there were snipers on the roof of the police building. So it shows you how quickly they were able to organize the community. Uh, uh, Milton and Richard Henry were with them and Goal was with them in this pursuit. So let me uh, play Jen's comments because they later developed some friction with some of the black nationalists about the case. Early, early activists in Detroit were uh, uh, Reverend Clegg who uh, later developed the Shrine of Black Madonna became uh, Jim Moser. Um, Brother Milton Henry and Richard Henry, uh, Henry brothers that uh, early on had developed a group on advanced leadership of Goal, which is an organization in Detroit that held uh, national, nationwide cultural events that helped develop one's political consciousness. We had the Black Eyes Conference in 1962 and 63 uh, that brought people from all over the country. I think I first met Max within this context of these national art conferences that we had. Uh, these people, in a lot of ways, provided a real spark of leadership for us as youth at the time. But what happened in every, almost every battle that we engaged them in, they always sell short or want to sell short and not care to move it to its conclusion. So I began to get a lot of respect for them that lasted for a while, but then waned quickly. One of the cases in point I think is kind of important was, uh, particularly in 1963, we have a, a black prostitute by the name of Cynthia Scott. Uh, was shot in the back by an officer, a white officer, police officer named Spicer, shot in the back five times and died on the street. Uh, the police department refused to take any action against it. So we, when I say we, a group of students then, I was still at Wayne at Highland Park Community College, other students at Wayne State formed a little organization called Yuhuru that stood for Freedom in Swahili. And we began to organize street rallies and the projects all around the city around the Cynthia, Cynthia Scott case. Uh, we finally forced it into the headlines of uh, the newspapers locally. We had a big rally at Reverend Clegg's church. Uh, Milton Henry, who was an active attorney in the city at that time, uh, had testimony from, uh, from the police officer himself that really indicted him. Uh, we had a big rally at the church and they promised to play the tapes that were really indicted. Uh, Reverend Clegg was chairing the meeting uh, I had a group of young students with me from Highland Park and Wayne State. We were in the balcony. The church was packed. 
uh, we were told that the uh, the prosecutor attorney was going to come raid the church if the attempt if the attempt was made to play the tape. So we all band together in the middle of the balcony, prepared to jump out the balcony in the aisle if they came through to try to take the tape. And what happened after passing the plate about five times, gave up our little hard-earned Woolworths money I'd earned in, into the plate, then uh, Reverend Clegg would nigg on playing the tape. Uh, in truth, uh, kind of what they, they have been sanctioned legally to not play it. And But I think you could see the generational conflict, right? For the younger activists, they're like, we don't give a damn, you play the tape. Uh, for the older, uh, kind of more established activists, uh, they weren't willing to kind of buck the legal order. Uh, Uhuru, of course, kind of carried this forward and kind of is perhaps most known for kind of uh, shutting down basically an event to kind of like a, uh, it was a Kavanaugh administration event to try and uh, film something that would be used to try and get Detroit the Olympics in 1968, of course, the uh, famous Olympics in Mexico City with John Carlos and the uh, raised fist, right? If the Olympics, as Jen used to say, would have been in Detroit in 1968, it's likely all hell would have broke loose. But uh, they were uh, protesting and there were a bunch of civil rights groups, including CORE and the NAACP uh, that were boycotting because they didn't feel like Detroit were worthy of the Olympics because it refused to pass an open housing occupancy. This is when Thomas Poindexter was kind of leading the council at that time and, and actually putting in policies to prevent them from doing so. Uh, so they wound up uh, shutting down the Olympics and, and doing so in a way that the more mainline or shutting down this event uh, in a way that the more mainline organizations were unwilling to do and they jeered the national anthem uh, and attacked the runners. So here I'll have Jen, let Jen talk a bit about that. Uh, I, you know, uh, during the 60s, during the period of the 60s, we had, I had done, with our little grouping down at Wayne State University, Uhuru, and, and through our agitation, the National Cup through RAM, we had uh, attempted to do all kinds of education uh, to try to understand the system that we had. If we had nothing else, we'd go around quoting Miles and Tom, you know, I know your enemies and know your friends. And if we just could get a simple answer to that question, it's one that could be answered over and over again. Uh, to to Miles and Tongue, that meant having some kind of form of class analysis. And our experience at that time had been that we had attempted to do that. We attempted to get little study groups together, try to tackle, if not if not the stuff coming out of the Soviet Union, Lenin and uh, Stalin and Marx and Engels, then at least approaching it from the standpoint of Miles and Tongue you know, Che Guevara and those kind of revolutionaries coming out of the third world. Uh, so uh, we have begun this kind of study and understanding. And when Malcolm began to, to talk about the class struggle, uh, when King even reached the point where he began to approach this thing from the standpoint of that understanding, uh, it was really acceptable to me because at that point, it was already growing up on some form of class analysis. We are not all the same from from my own experience of the, the fights with the elders we talked about earlier and their sell out or attempt not to carry the struggle to its conclusion. From my experience on these weekend militants that want to get up in the park and talk stuff. Uh, from my experience of the Black Eyes Conference and begin to see a split between what we later began to call the cultural nationalists and the revolutionary nationalists, there clearly was something going on besides skin color and national oppression. And that clear thing was some form of class oppression amongst us uh, in the class stratification of the black community. So by the time Malcolm was arriving at that, I'm already headstrong in it. And, uh, and, I, and I, I can see the differences, but it's not really articulated, you know, a proper way. So uh, by the time he arrives in that position, I'm already there, you know, with revolutionary nationalists. We want to talk about some form of class struggle here in this country and not just a cultural struggle to be, make things culturally correct. What so, so let me uh, just clarify the, the heading on this one. So General, ultimately, there was a, a runner. His name was Hayes Jones. He won a gold medal in 1960. And he was going to be running the torch in. And then they were going to light the torch. And they were going to film it and present this thing. And then strike the band and whatever. And uh, when he came, Jen and the others he was with took their picket signs and started beating Hayes Jones and said, you know, we, we're not running for the white man anymore. Uh, and, and kind of disrupted the whole event. And they got arrested for disturbing the peace. The mainline civil rights groups, uh, people from CORE and NAACP, they were told that if you apologize publicly, we'll drop the charges. 
and the members of Uhuru that were arrested uh, said, we, they said, we, we don't apologize for anything black people do in this racist land. And this, uh, this kind of case ultimately carried forward for about three and a half years uh, before it was ultimately dismissed. But they, they wouldn't apologize uh, in juxtaposition to the civil rights groups that were, and people from civil rights groups that were arrested. Uh, oh, sorry. I, you know, uh, this is, and I'll, I'll probably end here because I want to hopefully get a couple questions, but uh, you can see the trajectory Jen is coming from kind of like an action-oriented focus, uh, trying to find an outlet for it and to find people uh, who are willing to fight like he is uh, in the early 60s. And he kind of comes to, develops locally, but also amongst the national network, what he's referring to as revolutionary nationalism, uh, which is best kind of indicated in his, his association with what, what becomes the revolutionary action movement. And I mentioned this because the sign you see here, the Black Liberation Front, was literally a front for the revolutionary action movement that formed while General and four others uh, visited Cuba in the summer of 1964. So you can see General here, Luke Tripp next to him, Charles Simmons here. This is my former teacher, uh, Ernie Allen, or Ernie M. Kalimoto. He's a very young man. Uh, as well as th this gentleman here, if you're familiar with the case, uh, was brought up on charges for plotting to blow up the Statue of Liberty, uh, Robert Collier, right? Who met a woman from, a, who was French Canadian on this trip and kind of gotten trapped by a uh, police officer, Ray Wood, who's been in the news a lot lately as his nephew's trying to make money off his memoir. Uh, but that, that was kind of uh, where the Black Liberation Front was founded and kind of like when Ram really starts to take a more public posture. Uh, so here's General talking about the influence, how Cuba kind of really altered his outlook uh, for good. Oh, here. Uh, I, the particular incident was when we were there as students, uh, a Cuban sugar mill was bombed by an American plane. And we went down to see the sugar mill after it was bombed and a uh, mother and a baby was killed in the bombing and we went to the funeral uh, of the Cuban citizens that were killed. And we saw the markers of the plane that was shot down it had clearly U.S. markers on it. And the next day we were able to read the uh, New York Times down in Cuba that flatly denied it. And at one point for me, I uh, made the world a difference. As a matter of fact, I had to go back to the hotel room, kind of lock myself up for a couple of days just to try to, you know, get a rebalance my thinking and stuff on this world. I mean, if I, if I were told a lie that blatant, then I can't even believe my ABC. So it's a question of trying to go back and try to look at just where you're at on this thing, what you're prepared to do. In a lot of ways, I left the Cuba planning to not to come back to the state side. I was going to, like I said earlier, I was going to try to go to Africa. I tried to get a trade, couldn't get one. So by now, I'm going to go anyway, use this route to get there. Uh, a lot of things happened in Cuba uh, that changed me in a lot of ways. Uh, uh, we played baseball, Fidel Castro, that wasn't all that important. Uh, we had a meeting with Che Guevara, uh, a couple of meetings with Che Guevara, one where he addressed all the students. That was phenomenal. Uh, in my, and the impression that he, that he left uh, with me as a student at that time was, was tremendous and helped resolve my, my uh, revolutionary convictions. Uh, the numerous times the meetings that we had with Robert F. Williams when we were there was mind-boggling. I mean, I uh, had read a little about Rob, had never met him, him meeting with him and Mabel, and long discussions he would have with us, tell us various things to do. I should put out, point out, because I think it's very important that the, at the time we were in Cuba, June of 1964 to August of 1964, by the same time that Malcolm is traveling uh, to Mecca in the East. And so we had a lot of experience. Rob, Rob Williams had told us that we should go around and talk to uh, some, some of all the other people here uh, in the various embassies you know, from the third world. And there was also opportunities for discussions with other third world fighters that were there at Cuba recuperate. So Cuba wasn't just like Cuba, it was a real international center of people that were resisting and fighting and uh, fighting for their survival. Uh, I'm gonna skip the second one just for uh, time's sake, but General used to always tell the story about how they would, they traveled all across the island and they were free to go wherever they wanted uh, and were given money to go travel on the buses. 
and they, they wound up going to all these different embassies and they looked at their passports and they couldn't figure out the, the one white nation where they weren't allowed to go was Albania. So they were like, all right, we got to see what this is about. So they met with the Albanians and they said, we don't understand all these are Asian or, you know, uh, people of color. Why can't, you know, why can't you travel to Albania? And the Albanian ambassador said, my friend, we've been fighting imperialism since Julius Caesar. Uh, he still love telling that story. Uh, and I, I think it's a great one. I, I wanted to kind of end here, but show you kind of what was taken from this when he came back and when his comrades came back in the sense that they were, Ram had said that they, they hoped to build a, a revolutionary force that could overthrow the state within a five-year period, right? Uh, and they came back hoping to do so, general, certainly. Uh, and they started various different uh, local organizations. This was a student group that was kind of RAM affiliated, a uh, paper they put out called The Razor. And this was part of the attempt to kind of like uh, on the Northern side, they were trying to introduce revolutionary nationalism to SNCC in the South, as well as spread it throughout the North. And then also they created locally, they're kind of like, you know, there's there was no central leadership apparatus of RAM. There was a cell structure. so they created their own kind of like program. And the program they created was through an organization they called Black Vanguard after Uhuru kind of shut down. And this is telling because you see the image here of a broken shackles holding up a weapon. This was taken specifically from the Crusader magazine. Uh, and conversely, uh, let me move ahead. In 1965, they put out this statement. This is John Williams, Charles Simmons, Charles Mao Johnson, General, and Charles Simmons, oh, John, John Williams. Uh, and they put this out in 1965, uh, really three and a half years before the League of Revolutionary Black Workers were, was founded. It says, we are calling upon all the black brothers to meet the call of the League of Black Workers and join in to take full advantage of the power we hold. To utilize this power, let me move this thing, Successfully, we must be well organized in and outside of the plants and throughout the black ghettos. Join the League of Black Workers. We cannot lose for the ultimate power lies in our hands and we have nothing to lose but our chains. So I think I'll end here because it just shows that kind of like this ideal had been fomenting and it waited the appropriate conditions to take advantage of uh, opportunity to then organize around this basic idea. Thank you all for your time.